in his own country. He had departed for France to try his luck there. The purpose of this letter is to make a second appeal to the Milanese Senate, though it's clear that Raimondi does not hold out much hope. The tone of the letter is one of bitter recrimination at the unfair treatment he had received those years before. He has seen others less worthy than himself being rewarded. Why should he alone be deprived of the opportunity to better himself? The tone of another letter written about the same time is similar. This letter was addressed to a particular member of the Milanese Senate and a man of influence in Milan, Giovanni Corvini. Raimondi had appealed to Corvini to take up his cause, but Corvini had declined. While Raimondi does not hesitate to express his admiration for Corvini's attainments, indeed he sees him as the perfect example of the accomplished citizen. His general tone is again one of extreme bitterness that Corvini had not been prepared to lend him assistance, a refusal which had consigned Raimondi to a life of poverty, the abandonment of study, and a constant pleading for work in one place or another, to the point where he had been effectively driven into exile. Ramoni's initial response to this new life in Avignon was decidedly lukewarm. Even in the academy there, he can hardly find a text on eloquence. Indeed, he seems to have reached a land where even the name Cicero is unknown. However, he is determined to persevere in his pursuit of eloquence. And he has turned to philosophy to relieve his feelings of despair. And it is in a spirit of defiance that he ends his letter to Corvini with these words. Those who delight in my misfortune need to know that no matter how cruelly fate has treated me, I am feeling neither hopeless nor dejected, but rather determined to struggle against the tide and reach the harbour I have long desired. Well, true to his own words, Raimondi did set about the task of establishing himself at Avignon, employing whatever strategies he could. Early in 1432, he sent to uh, one of his patrons, he did have one or two patrons at Avignon, and he said, sent to one of them, Giovanni Cadar, uh, a brief treatise entitled De Laudibus Eloquentiae, in praise of eloquence, in which he extolled and illustrated the value of eloquence not only for those involved in the management of affairs, but also for those engaged in a wide variety of occupations. <coughs> in November of the same year, he sent a copy of the same little treatise to Antonio Canobio, another senator at Milan. And he circulated other copies of this little treatise in Avignese circles. At the same time, he continued to cultivate contacts uh, in Italy, trying to keep open the possibility of returning there. He sent to one of the cardinals at Milan a sample of dedicatory verses accompanied by a letter which is sadly, sadly pathetic in its obsequiousness. It appears too that Raimondi has begun to study law. Well, 
if there is a certain desperation about Raimondi's exertions during these early years at Avignon, there is also some indication that his efforts are beginning to pay off. In fact, it is from late in 1432 that we have Raimondi's most optimistic appraisal of his situation. This is in a letter which he sent to his friend, Nicola Archimboldi at Milan, accompanying a copy of the same little treatise on eloquence. He must have sent that little treatise to absolutely everybody he knew. <laughs> he tells his friend that he is in excellent health, he is in need of nothing, he has received some commissions for composing letters, some even to princes and kings. He says that he is sending 92 elegiac poems to Giovanni Corvini. He reports that his little treatise on eloquence has been so well received that there is nobody in all of France who has a higher reputation for eloquence than himself. Indeed, he believes that he has excelled any of the orators or poets in Milan, and he compares himself with Julius Caesar, who said, ironically, when he was in France, that he preferred to be the sole ruler anywhere in the world than share the command of Rome with others. Raimondi concludes this letter to his friend, a letter that is brimming with confidence and optimism. And yet, yes, not a little self-congratulation, with a promise to write more frequently. The date of the letter is November 1432. His next letter to this same friend was sent almost three years later, and it was his last. It is a letter written in elegiac couplets. What occurred during the intervening three years, we don't know. But what is clear is that Raimondi's world has fallen apart. Employing language and imagery drawn from Latin ec epic poetry, Raimondi pictures himself as the exiled hero, harried on all sides by trials and dangers to the point where his final day looms. Ad nisi mei credam nunc ultima parti, et summum quae me tolat ad esse diem. I believe that fate's last day is now upon me, and the day which will take me away is now at hand. A day for which he prepares his friend with these words. If any calamity should take your friend from you, if some storm should overwhelm his head, do him the honor of placing this epitaph over his tomb. Whom Virgil, whom Cicero, whom all the poets loved, here, Cosma, here you lie, a poet for the weeping. Well, the whole letter would read like mock epic if it were not so tragically prophetic of its sequel. Just six months later, in March 1436, Archimbaldi received another letter, again in Latin elegiac verse. This one from the Milanese scholar Ambrogio Crivelli. In a grim couplet, Crivelli announces that Cosma Raimondi is dead. Propria concidit illa manum. 